Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. If you could do me a quick favor, see that little subscribe button at the bottom of your screen? Go ahead, click that subscribe button. Really does help our channel grow, our audience grow, and I really do appreciate it more than you know. So click that subscribe button. Appreciate your support. Now, here's the video that you came here for. A little bit of college football, okay? So it's been a while since we talked college football. Obviously, it is because there hasn't been all that much in the news, but obviously as spring practices ramp up here over the next couple weeks, and oh, by the way, as the college hoop starts to ramp down, I think we'll probably dive a little bit deeper into more college football. Bring it up because while it has been quiet, there was a very interesting piece that came out on Wednesday afternoon about the biggest story, not just in college football, but maybe in all of sports in 2024. And that was the retirement of Nick Saban. Okay. So obviously look, we, 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 we've covered wall to wall, the retirement of Nick Saban, the hiring of Kalen DeBoer, but on Wednesday, a real deep dive, well done piece by Chris Lowe, who probably is the breakout media star of 2024. Like Chris Lowe has been doing this forever. He's been in the space forever. He is a legend, but he is having his best year in 2024 because he broke the Nick Saban story all by himself. There was no, uh, you know, other people uh, like he was the only one that had that. Okay. So credit to him on that. I believe he may have been the first one to break the Kalen DeBoer accepting the Alabama job, but on Wednesday, he tied all the pieces together in an incredible story for ESPN.com, detailing all of the craziness over about a six, seven day stretch with the Alabama Crimson Tide. Really started with the Rose Bowl loss to Michigan, obviously ending their season, going through Nick Saban's retirement, going through um, Greg Burns' search for a head coach, and oh, by the way, going through the culmination with Kalen DeBoer accepting the job and Kalen DeBoer obviously now in this first week just starting his first week of spring practice as Alabama's head coach so it was a fascinating piece but while different people seem to latch on to different things I saw a lot of people talk about Mike Norvell was interested in the job and Lane Kiffin could have gotten floors there was a lot of interesting things that came out of this piece okay but to me the single most interesting piece and maybe the single saddest piece is hearing directly from Nick Saban about why he decided to retire. Now, there were a number of different reasons. He talked about his age. He, he kind of referenced that he let Greg Byrne, the AD at Alabama, kind of know a year ago, Greg, I don't really know how much longer I'm going to do this. He talked about how some of the players reacted after the Rose Bowl loss. He wasn't very happy. And oh, by the way, he even talked about the fact that at 71-72, it was hard to keep and retain assistance. But if there was to me a single part of this story that reflected why Nick Saban retired and frankly, the scary truth about college football, it came when he talked about dealing with players in this transfer portal NIL era. And to be clear, I'll just say what I always say before we get into Nick Saban's quotes. Nobody is anti-players getting paid. Nobody is play anti-players not staying where staying where they don't want to be. But there have to be some degree of guardrails. Every single player on your roster cannot be a free agent 365 days a year for four or five years of eligibility. And so I bring it up because that current climate, more than anything else, seems to be the reason that Nick Saban decided to retire. Here is what. He told Chris Lowe about the decision to step aside at Alabama. Again, he referenced some stuff in the Rose Bowl and some stuff that he wasn't happy with, but here is what he said. He said, I thought we could have had a hell of a team next year and then maybe 70 or 80% of the players you talk to, all they want to know is two things. What assurances do I have that I'm going to play because they're thinking about transferring and how much are you going to pay me? Saban recounted, our program here was always built on how much value can we create for your future and your personal development, academic success in graduating, and developing an NFL career off the field. Saban continued, so I'm saying to myself, maybe this just doesn't work anymore, that the goals and aspirations are just different. 
and that it's all about how much money can I make as a college player. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that's never been what we're about, and it's not why we've had success through the years. So that was Nick Saban. In his own words, talking about the world of the NIL portal era, I thought we could have had a hell of a team next year, and then maybe 70 or 80% of the players you talk to, all they want to know is assurances about are they going to play, otherwise they'll transfer, and how much are you going to pay me? That is the reality, and I am here to say this. If you are a college football fan or a college sports fan, that is a scary snapshot of where we are in college football right now, and I cannot express it enough. We have to get some guardrails in place, okay? So first off, let me do the caveat that I just did 30 seconds ago. We won't spend too much time because I just did it. No one is anti-players getting paid. Nick Saban said it. I'm going to say it. I'm not speaking for Nick Saban, but I am saying Nobody is anti-players getting paid in NIL, okay? What a lot of people are, because I get it all the time, Torres, you're anti-NIL. I'm not anti-NIL. What I am anti is complete pay-for-play and complete free agency where there's no, again, no guardrails, no rules, no this, no that. Somebody can offer you while you're playing on an individual team. Like, it's just... It's insanity, and the crazy part is you never know what's fact from fiction. And by the way, you know who the biggest losers are in all of this? It's a lot of the players because they're being promised certain things. They're being convinced that you need to leave where you are because you're not going to get what you deserve, but come here, and we're going to take care of you. And a lot of times the players don't get the money they're promised. They don't get the playing time that they're promised. They don't get the things that they're promised. And a lot of times, you know what ends up happening? They get pushed out the door if they're not good enough at their current spot. And so the players, you know, listen, it's great if you're Caleb Williams. It's great if you're Jalen Milrow or whomever. But there are a lot of players getting screwed in this process. They leave places they're happy at thinking it's always going to be better. And that's simply not the case. So one, I'm not anti-players getting paid. I am a little anti-just complete chaos And I think that's where I'd be worried. And by the way, this is why I understand why Nick Saban retired. And that's kind of the sad part of that quote is to me, it is so obvious that things change so quickly, so fast, so drastically that we probably could have gotten two, three, four more years in Nick Saban. Not if the world was what it was in 1984 or even 2007 when he took over at Alabama, But if it didn't entirely become a pay-for-play, how much can you owe? Coach, I don't care. I don't care about the NFL. I don't care about next year. I don't care about five years from now. How much can you pay me right now? Let me give you a quick example, okay? Because I think what Nick Saban said is actually very important. He said, our program has always been built on how much value we can create for your future and your personal development, academic success in graduating and developing an NFL career. All right, so let's look just, again, those are Nick Saban's words, but let's just put them to action in real life. Let's use a couple examples from this past year. And by the way, I think this is one of the great things that Kalen DeBoer did that he doesn't get enough credit for. He kept most of that roster together post Nick Saban, which is kind of incredible. But think about being Nick Saban. Think about developing or uh, recruiting these kids, getting on the phone with them, doing FaceTimes, going to their home, promising them, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure you get your education. I'm going to make sure you get some NIL and we're going to develop you into an NFL player. And then think about the the, the time that you put into it, the energy that you put into these young men to help them reach their full potential. And they're coming to you after the season saying, coach, I know I was playing, but I got to get paid. Coach, I know you promised me. You told me when I was being recruited. Year one, I was going to redshirt. Year two, I was going to see the field. Year three, I was going to be a breakout star. But it's year two, and I don't got to wait till next year because this school is offering me this. Of course, it would drive you crazy if you're Nick Saban. And again, it is the sad part of where we are in college sports. I'll give you a quick example. There was a kid on Alabama this past year named Isaiah Bond, okay? And I don't know every detail of his recruitment and his situation, but Isaiah Bond was the leading receiver at Alabama last year, okay? Um, he entered the portal the day Nick Saban retired and committed to Texas about 48 to 72 hours later. So forgive me for believing 
that he only entered the portal because Nick Saban was leaving and that he only committed to, to, to Texas on a chance that they waited until after he um, after he entered the portal to contact him. If you just read the tea leaves on that one, it feels pretty obvious that someone got in his ear. You can go somewhere else, whatever. And I think this is probably the perfect example of the kind of kid that was driving Nick Saban crazy in this new world. Because think about it. Think about Isaiah Bond as an example. And Alabama fans, I know you know what I'm talking about. This was a kid. Was the leading receiver at Alabama this past year, okay? He was a kid that was projected down the road. He wasn't draft eligible, but he he was going to be a first, second round pick. And I'm sure he's getting taken care of in NIL, but here's the kicker with somebody like him. He had one of the great plays in the history of Alabama football. He was the kid on the other end of the second and 27 catch in the Iron Bowl at Jordan-Hare Stadium against Auburn that gave Alabama a win got them to the SEC championship game with a chance to go to the playoff and, of course, allowed them to then get to Georgia, beat Georgia, and win the SEC and play in the playoff. And that kid decides to transfer. That kid decides there's a better option out there. And again, do what you want. I'm not telling you what to do and what not to do and how to live your life, okay? But what I am saying is, this is what I know. Can't say he wasn't playing because he was playing. Can't say he wasn't getting opportunities because he was the leading receiver. But beyond that, and this is what I think is lost in this current generation, and I'm not that old, but I understand Nick Saban's frustration. It's that that is the type of kid. He talked, Nick Saban, about creating value for, um, you know, beyond just your playing career. Well, that's a kid. The value was created the second he caught that second and 27 pass from Jalen Milrow. Because guess what? From now on, he is forever an Alabama icon, okay? And I've spent enough time in these college towns to know what that means with Alabama football is this. You're never going to pay for another meal. If you want to work in Alabama post, uh, post football, somebody's going to help you get a job. You want to work in the media, you're immediately going to be credible in a radio, TV setting, whatever. Oh, by the way, you want to do autograph signings? People are going to sign up to get your autograph for the next 50 years. I have been, I, I was telling a buddy of mine this. I was at Rupp Arena about two, three years ago. There was a player that I had never even heard of as a college basketball fan that played at Kentucky, you know, 25, 30 years ago. But he was doing an autograph signing. There was a light out the door. And not for John Wall, not for Tyrese Maxey, not for, uh, you know, whoever, Jamal Mashburn, the greatest Kentucky players ever, some guy I'd never even heard of. And that's who Isaiah Bond could have been in Alabama. And he just gave it all away to go to Texas. Do what you want, Isaiah Bond. I'm not here to criticize. I am here to say this is crazy in the current era. And here, and this is my last thought. You want to know the craziest part of all of it to me? Nick Saban, if there's anyone in college football that should be immune to this, it's Nick Saban. Because he's the greatest of all time. He has a track record of 20 plus years of sending dudes to the NFL, of preparing you for the next level, of preparing good fathers and, 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 and husbands and this and that. And he's still dealing with it. So imagine what it's like to be a first time head coach or a guy that doesn't have the street cachet of Nick Saban, the guy who doesn't have seven national championships. And again, I go back to what I said. Listen, Nick Saban was never going to coach forever. And there are some valid points as to why he got out, including the churn of assistant coaches. Every year losing two, three guys, and it was harder and harder to replace them because nobody wanted to come to Alabama for a year and not know how much longer Nick Saban was there. But I do believe if we had some level, I'm not saying eliminate NIL, I'm not saying eliminate the transfer portal, but if we had some level of balance between it being 100% coach being in control and 100% the players being able to call the shots. I think Nick Saban is still coaching. By the way, in college basketball, I think Jay Wright is probably still coaching. Coach K, maybe. Roy Williams probably would have retired. But anyway, it's just crazy. It's sad. And man, oh man, oh man. Do I wish we could have got a couple more years in Nick Saban, but this shows you what it is like to be a college football coach in 2024. It's a lot of money. 
but it doesn't seem very fun to me. If you enjoyed this video, do me a quick favor. Make sure to subscribe to the Aaron Torres Pod YouTube channel. Click that little subscribe button. New videos popping up every single day. College football, college basketball. Also, make sure to subscribe to the Aaron Torres Podcast wherever you get podcasts, new episodes, several times a week.